So uh, my name is uh, Erling Norby. I have my background in the field of medicine. I was a professor of virology at the Karolinska Institute for 25 years. And then uh, I moved to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, where I was a so-called permanent secretary. So I have the little special title of being a former permanent secretary. Uh, I have my office at the Center for the History of Science, which tells you that I've become more and more interested in how does science evolve. And in studying that, I've taken advantage of, of absolutely unique material that we have at both the Karolinska Institute and at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And these are the archives of the Nobel Prizes. Now, the Nobel Prizes have been uh, distributed for more than 100 years. And it's by far the most prestigious prize that there is in science. And the reason for that is that one has developed a very efficient technique to select Nobel Prize laureates. And that what I will tell you first is a little about how do we go about it. But maybe we should start, actually, with a will that Alfred Nobel wrote in 1895. And I've just extracted a part of that will in order to emphasize some of the uh, specifications that he gave. And you can see from this text here that there should be one part should give even a prize in the field of physics. And, and that should be for the most important discovery or invention. And then it should be another prize in chemistry, and that should be for a discovery or an improvement. And the third prize in natural sciences is to physiology or medicine. And that can only be given for a discovery. So we have to reflect very carefully on well, what is a discovery. And that is an ongoing debate even now, 100 years after the first crisis. In uh, Nobel's will, it specified who is going to be responsible for uh, selecting the prize recipients, but the, the so-called Nobel institutions. So there are four bodies that are responsible for selecting the prize recipients that are the prize-giving institutions. The first uh, institution is the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, which is responsible for both the prize in physics and in chemistry. And then the Karolinska Institute is responsible for the prize in physiology or medicine. And the Swedish Academy uh, of Literature is responsible for the prize in literature. And there's also a peace prize, and that is given by a committee selected by the, the, the House of Parliament in Norway. And it's a five-member committee. <clears throat> there is, in order to uh, implement Nobel's will, which actually took quite some time, uh, he died in 1896, and it wasn't until 1900 that one could start giving Nobel Prizes. The reason was there was not a formal body that could receive the money and take care of the money. And therefore, one created something that it's, that's called the Nobel Foundation. Nobel Foundation uh, is not mentioned in the will, uh, but it, it serves a very important or several important functions for the prize-giving institution. One is, of course, to take care of the money and to secure that the money is well uh, cared for and, and uh, that the one can keep the price up at a, at a good level. The uh, other is for legal uh, aspects. So the Nobel Foundation is responsible for making sure that the legality of, uh, of uh, the way the work is done is correct. Uh, the third is that, for practical reasons, the Nobel Foundation arranged the prize ceremony in Stockholm, which includes all pr prize recipients except uh, the Peace Prize, of course, which has its own ceremony in Oslo. So uh, these are the bodies. And how do these different bodies go about selecting Nobel laws? In order to understand that, we need to look at something I can call the Nobel year. And th this is a comprehensive process that been, has evolved over many, many years. But there are certain absolute specifications that need to be addressed. The first is that in order to be considered for a Nobel Prize, you have to be nominated for the prize. And uh, only invited people can, can nominate someone to the prize. And if you see in this clock, the yellow uh, blur, blurbs, if you call them so, uh, they illustrate that first we select who is going to invite, invite to uh, give, potentially give a recommendation for a prize. And then uh, this is sent out. And the red uh, 
this circle here illustrates that the nominations should be in before January 31st, in the year when the price is going to be given. And uh, over all these years, uh, of course, there have been variations in the number of invitations sent out and the number of nominations. But in the, at the present time, we send uh, nominations or invitations to nominate to more than two, three thousand uh, individuals or organizations, and we get of the order of three, four, sometimes even five hundred nominations. So it's a huge material to, to manage. Once all the nominations are in, then, of course, the, the Nobel Committee starts to do its work. What the commit, Nobel Committee has done all the since the very beginning, it is to make in-depth reviews, very careful reviews of uh, uh, a certain proposal. And then these reviews are prepared during the summer and in August each year at that time, then the committee compiles all the different uh, reviews and start to really make further prioritization about to see which are the real runners up. And uh, in September, this discussion goes on, and uh, hopefully then a committee comes to an agreement that, that this year we would like to propose this particular candidate. Most often, these candidates have been discussed for many years before that. It, it, the whole process, uh, is imp it's important that one can consolidate this and one can make repeated reviews. So what is it in the Nobel archives that make it so interesting? That is, first of all, nominations. They could be in many different languages. It could be in uh, Spanish, in, in, in uh, French, or in German, or whatever. Uh, and then the reviews, which are in Swedish. And this material is a unique real-time evaluation of science, the way one looked at science at that particular time. And then there's one more thing to the archives, and that is when one started to understand that they were interesting material, one decided that there should be a 50-year secrecy. So we're not allowed to look at the material until 50 years has passed. But after that, they are available for scholarly work. It's not for the journalists to go in there, well, just out of curiosity to look at it, but for scholarly work. And I have come to be involved in using this unique material. And the, the more I have worked with this material, the more uh, impressed I've been of, of what, what, a, what a unique kind of material it is. It actually started way back in 2005. It so happened that Dr. Stan Prusner here at UCSF, uh, who has his own Nobel Prize for the discovery of, of prions, he and, and I, we were both interested in understanding the Nobel Prize in 1954 to Thomas Weller, Frederick Ramos, and John Anders. And this is a very important Nobel Prize. They could show that poliovirus could grow in any kind of cells. And before that, the dogma was that poliovirus can only replicate in nerve cells. And because they could show this, all by a sudden it became possible to make a vaccine against polio. And that was the most dramatic achievement because during the first half of the, of the 20th century, polio was the number one disease that is so scare, as a scare in society. And, and that is almost forgotten today because uh, we have been so successful in vaccinating and removing the disease. But the question here was, why did the Nobel Committee rush it? Why didn't they wait uh, and uh, include Jonas Salk in the prize and things like that? And we could really get some insight into that and could write a rather interesting uh, evaluation of the, the way one had discussed this in the Nobel Committee. And a little, almost a little surprise, we could publish this in a regular scientific uh, journal. At that stage, I realized maybe one could actually turn it in, into a book. And that led to uh, that in 2010, I published a book on Nobel Prizes and life sciences. So it includes uh, both some background material about uh, Alfred Nobel, about how the, the, the will came about, about how, uh, the, the, how it has been the, the formal aspect of the prize. It, it discusses phenomena like serendipity and then the different fields that I mentioned here. It also actually discusses nucleic acids, which, which of course is a very central field when it comes to changing of attitude. And I call that chapter a drama in five acts. Uh, and I'm not going to go into any, any detail in that. But 
just to mention that a part of this was a very careful evaluation of Oswald Avery and his, the discussion about him, him in Nobel Prize uh, context. This is a person who should have received a Nobel Prize, but who never did. And there are several reasons for that. He was way ahead of his time when he, in 1944, published that if you extracted DNA out of pneumococci, you could change the properties of other pneumococci, but simply transferring DNA. And it was not believed by the scientific community. And a lot of uh, antagonists, even in his own institution at the Rockefeller Institute, as it was called, and later Rockefeller University. Uh, but he was discussed carefully. In fact, it, the year after he died, there was a posthumous nomination of him. And uh, that was evaluated uh, for a prize in chemistry. It was evaluated by the Swedish uh, Nobel laureate, Tiselius. And he said that had this material been available before, had he been alive, he should have had a Nobel Prize. So this is an example of, uh, uh, of a name that should have been in the list of Nobel laureates, but it's not there. Now, Inspired by this, this, the first book that I made in 2010, I continue to review the archives. Now, this new book is actually 50% larger than the previous one. It discusses mostly prices between 1960 and 62. And these are very important years, of course. So that's, a, that's a very important price in immunology in 1960 for so-called induced tolerance. That is, that our immune system must be of the kind that it does not react against our own cells. And therefore, during the embryonic development, uh, the uh, immune system is the cells that can react with our own body are obliterated. And it's a very important mechanism. This, this is a little interesting to discuss Burnett and Medford because Burnett was a virologist. He was a dominating virologist of his generation. And the committee discussed this from 1948 and onward and said a uh, Nobel Prize should be given to Burnett. He is such an outstanding virologist. But one couldn't really find a good discovery among all the things that he had discovered. And therefore, uh, but, but, but Burnett was also a fantastic uh, life science philosopher. And he speculated about the defense mechanism, the immune defense mechanism, and he postulated that such a phenomenon of tolerance must exist. And therefore, in 1960, the Nobel Committee, on its own initiative, combined Burnett, who was a virologist, but had postulated that you could induce this tolerance, and Meda, who has proven that, that in various experiments with his collaborators. These two uh, persons, Peter Meadow and McFarlane and Burnett, are, are two giants in science. They're the incredible statesmen of science. And they influence science in many different ways, not the least through the fantastic books that they, they have written. And I wanted to share with you this particular picture because it's, it's, it's a quite historical picture. The man in the middle here is, is uh, Lawrence Bragg. He's the youngest Nobel laureate ever. He got uh, the Nobel Prize together with his father when he was 25 years old. And uh, in medicine, the youngest one is actually 32 years. And, but what makes this picture unique is that this is taken in 1943, in the middle of World War II. Bragg was representing something called the British Council, and that was to further cultural contacts between the different countries in Europe. But there wasn't very many countries that they could con con contact, but Sweden was one of them, because Sweden was, managed to stay after the Second World War. So here, Bragg flies into uh, to, to Stockholm and visits Uppsala, and the people you see, if you go from the left to the right, are all these major actors. The T. Swedberg, the Nobel laureate, 1926. Uh, Arne Fredga, who was a member for a long, long time. Arne Tiselius, Nobel laureate, 1948. And Gunnar Hegg, to the right of, uh, of Bragg. And then there's also a, a physicist, uh, Axel Lind, who is here. Uh, but it's amazing to, to reflect on the fact that this is just 1943. Now, Bragg is a very, very central person to, the, to our story. And uh, the story has to do with what happened in 1962. But then, as you probably all know, in 1953, Watson and Crick published the double helix structure of DNA. And that was published on uh, April 28th that year. 
one would think then that, that this is the, most, the, the number one discovery of the previous century, that this would be immediately taken up by the scientific community, processed and, and really interpreted and integrated in the science of the day. But the step that was to be taken, namely to conclude that, that DNA as the information carrying molecule was a very major step and it took time. And this is reflected in the quite su surprising uh, phenomenon, namely that it took until 1960 before there was any nomination for a prize to Watson and Crick. And the one who person who took the initiative that was Bragg. Because Bragg was responsible for the Cavendish laboratory and he knew uh, very well both what's going on uh, in the Watson and Crick discovery, but also the protein studies that were done in Cavendish. And to be tactical, the way Bragg did is he nominated the, the protein crystallographers, Perus and Kendrow, and actually also another crystallographer, Hodgkin, for a prize in physics. And then he nominated Watson Crick. And since he knew about the complicated story, he also included Wilkins. And so they were nominated for a prize in chemistry. The physics committee immediately say, no, uh, this, uh, this is not our responsibility. So the chemistry committee have to consider both these nominations. And that led to long discussions and uh, followed up through the years. You can see the numbers of nominations here. Notice that most of the nominations are for Watson and Crick, but some nominations are in, also include Wilkins. And that's, of course, a long story in, in itself. So the prize were awarded in 1962. And uh, Wilkins, what included? Here I can see that Crick receiving the prize, Watson stands behind him, and Wilkins further back. And to the left are, of course, Perus and Kendro. This was a, a, year, a year of, of scientific giants, and a lot can be said about the, uh, the, these particular prizes. It is striking that when these three recipients, Crick, Watson, and Wilkins, were going to give their Nobel lectures, Crick certainly did not talk about the structure of DNA. He talked about the genetic code because immense things had happened uh, in these years between 53 and 62. Watson spoke about the importance of RNA, not about the, the DNA double helix. Wilkins was the only one that talked about the structure of DNA. Jim Watson, when he received the Nobel Prize, was 34 years old. And he uh, is the third youngest among those that have received a prize in physiology or medicine. The youngest is that uh, uh, Banting, who received the prize for, for discovering insulin. And then uh, Josh Lederberg was 33, but, but uh, Watson was 34. And being in good health, he could revisit Sweden in 2012 to celebrate his uh, 50 years anniversary of receiving the Nobel Prize. And here he is on stage with Matt Ridley, who is interviewing him and asking him what happened in the morning of February 28, 1953, when you were the first one who understood the structure of DNA. And that is history alive.